Live from Washington, General Westmoreland's report to the Congress. The program normally seen at this time will not be presented today in order to bring you this NBC News special report. Here now is NBC News correspondent Robert Goralski in Washington. For the first time in American history, a military commander is to report to Congress on a war that is still going on. Never before has the general left the combat area to speak before the legislators. General William Westmoreland, commander of U.S. forces in Vietnam, will shortly enter this, the chamber of the House of Representatives, to address a joint meeting of Congress. Members of the cabinet have just walked down the center aisle. Speaker of the House, John, John McCormick. Vice President Hubert Humphrey presiding over the Senate in this joint meeting of Congress. The doorkeeper of the House of Representatives, William Miller, known as Fishbait, will shortly announce the arrival of General Westmoreland. It is through this door that the General will enter after being introduced by the doorkeeper of the House of Representatives. Members of the Diplomatic Corps, the Cabinet, of course all the members of the House and Senate attending this joint meeting of the U.S. Congress to hear from General William Westmoreland, Commander of U.S. Forces in Vietnam. Mr. Speaker, <coughs> General William C. Westmoreland. The general is flanked by an escort of 17 members of the House and the Senate, appointed by the leadership, Democrats and Republicans, to walk down the center aisle with the general. This is a standing ovation. The members of the House and the Senate shake hands with the Vice President, House Speaker John McConnell. The general will be formally introduced by Speaker McCormick. applause for General Westmoreland. He stands nodding. So far, certainly no indication of the controversy that surrounds his presence here before this joint meeting. Members of the Congress, I have the great pleasure and the high privilege of presenting to you General William C. Westmoreland, United States Army, Commander, the United States Military Assistance Command, Vietnam. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, members of Congress, I am deeply honored to address the Congress of the United States. I stand in the shadow of military men who have been here before me, but none of them could have had more pride than mine in representing the gallant American fighting men in Vietnam today.
These service men and women are sensitive to their mission. And as the record shows, they are unbeatable in carrying out that mission. As their commander in the field, I have seen many of you in Vietnam during the last three years. Without exception, you gentlemen have shown interest, responsibility, and concern for the commitment which we have undertaken and for the welfare of our troops. The Republic of Vietnam is fighting to build a strong nation while aggression, organized, directed, and supported from without, attempts to engulf it. This is an unprecedented challenge for a small nation. But it is a challenge which will confront any nation that is marked as a target for the communist stratagem called War of National Liberation. I can assure you here and now, that militarily, this strategy will not succeed in Vietnam. In three years of close study and daily observation, I have seen no evidence that this is an internal insurrection. I have seen much evidence to the contrary, documented by the enemy himself, that it is aggression from the North. Since 1954, when the Geneva Accords were signed, the North Vietnamese have been sending leaders, political organizers, technicians, and experts on terrorism and sabotage into the South clandestinely directed from the North. They and their Hanoi-trained Southern counterparts have controlled the entire course of attack against the Republic of South Vietnam. More than two years ago, North Vietnamese divisions began to arrive, and control was no longer clandestine. Since then, the buildup of enemy forces has been formidable. During the last 22 months, the number of enemy combat battalions in the South has increased significantly, and nearly half of them are now North Vietnamese. In the same period, overall enemy strength has nearly doubled in spite of large combat losses. Enemy commanders are skilled professionals. In general, their troops are indoctrinated well-trained, aggressive, and under tight control. The enemy's logistic system is primitive in many ways. Forced to transport most of his supplies down through southeastern Laos, he uses a combination of trucks, bicycles, men, and animals. But he does this with surprising effectiveness. In South Vietnam, the system is also well organized. Many of the caches we have found and destroyed have been stocked with enough supplies and equipment to support months of future operations. The enemy emphasizes what he calls strategic mobility, although his tactics are based on foot mobility, relatively modest firepower, and often primitive means of communication. However, his operational planning is meticulous. He gathers intelligence, makes careful plans, assigns specific objectives in detail, and then rehearses the plan of attack until he believes it cannot fail. Local peasants are forced to provide food, shelter, and porters to carry supplies and equipment for combat units and to evacuate the dead and wounded from the battlefield. When all is ready, he moves his large military formations covertly from concealed bases 
into the operational area. His intent is to launch a surprise attack designed to achieve quick victory by shock action. This tactic has failed because of our courageous men, our firepower, and our spoiling attacks. For months now, we have been successful in destroying a number of main force units. We will continue to seek out the enemy, catch him off guard, and punish him at every opportunity. But success against his main forces alone is not enough to ensure a swift and decisive end to the conflict. The enemy also uses terror, murder, mutilation, abduction, and the deliberate shelling of innocent men, women, and children to exercise control through fear. Terror, which he employs daily, is much harder to counter than his best conventional moves. A typical day in Vietnam was last Sunday. Terrorists near Saigon assassinated a 39-year-old village chief the same day in the Delta. They kidnapped 26 civilians assisting in arranging for local elections. The next day, the Viet Cong attacked a group of revolutionary development workers killing one and wounding 12 with grenades and machine gun fire in one area, and in another they opened fire on a small civilian bus and killed three and wounded four of its passengers. These are cases of calculated enemy attack on civilians to extend by fear that which they cannot gain by persuasion. One hears little of this brutality here at home. What we do hear about is our own aerial bombing against North Vietnam. And I would like to address this for a moment. For years, the enemy has been blowing bridges, interrupting traffic, cutting roads, sabotaging power stations, blocking canals, and attacking airfields in the South. And he continues to do so. This is a daily occurrence. Bombing in the North has been centered on precisely these same kinds of targets and for the same military purposes, to reduce the supply, interdict the movement, and impair the effectiveness of enemy military forces. Within his capabilities, the enemy in Vietnam is waging total war, all day, every day, everywhere. He believes in force, and his uh, intensification of violence is limited only by his resources and not by any moral inhibitions. To us, a ceasefire means ceasefire. Our observance of past truces has been open and subject to public scrutiny. The enemy permits no such observation in the North or the South. He traditionally has exploited ceasefire periods when the bombing has been suspended to increase his resupply and infiltration activity. This is the enemy. This has been the challenge. The only strategy which can defeat such an organization is one of unrelenting but discriminating military, political, and psychological pressure on his whole structure and at all levels. From his capabilities and his recent activities, I believe the enemy's probable course of action in the months ahead can be forecast. In order to carry out his battlefield doctrine, I foresee that he will continue his buildup across the demilitarized zone and through Laos. And he will attack 
when he believes he has a chance for a dramatic blow. He will not return exclusively to guerrilla warfare, although he certainly will continue to intensify his guerrilla activity. I expect the enemy to continue to increase his mortar, artillery, rocket, and re recoilless rifle attacks on our installations. At the same time, he will step up his attacks on villages and district towns to intimidate the people and to thwart the democratic processes now underway in South Vietnam. Given the nature of the enemy, it seems to me that the strategy we are following at this time is the proper one, and that it is producing results. While he obviously is far from quitting, there are signs that his morale and his military structure are beginning to deteriorate. The rate of decline will be in proportion to the pressure directed against him. Faced with this prospect, it is gratifying to know that our forces and those of the other free world allies have grown in strength and profited from experience. In this connection, it is well to remember that Korea, Australia, New Zealand, Thailand, and the Philippines all have military forces fighting and working with the Vietnamese and Americans in Vietnam. It is also worthy of note that 30 other nations are providing non-combat support. All of these free world forces are doing well, whether in combat or in support of nation building. Their exploits deserve recognition, not only for their direct contributions to the overall effort, but for their symbolic reminder that the whole of free Asia opposes communist expansion. As the focal point of this struggle in Asia, the Republic of Vietnam Armed Forces merit special attention. Before 1954, South Vietnam had no armed forces in being, and there was no tradition of military leadership. The requirement to build an army, navy, and air force in the face of enemy attack and subversion seems in retrospect as almost an impossible task. Yet, in their determination to resist the communists, the Vietnamese have built an effective military force. <laughs> what I see now in Vietnam is a military force that performs with growing professional skill. During the last six months, Vietnamese troops have scored repeated successes against some of the best Viet Cong and North Vietnamese Army units. Perhaps more important in this total effort is the support given by the Vietnamese military to the government's nation-building or revolutionary development program. Nearly half of the Vietnamese Army is now engaged in or in training for this vital program, which will improve the lot of the people. This is a difficult role for a military force. Vietnamese soldiers are not only defending villages and hamlets, but with spirit and energy, they have turned to the task of nation building as well. In 1952, there were some who doubted that the Republic of Korea would ever have a first-rate fighting force. I wish those, those doubters could see the Korean units in Vietnam today. They rank with the best fighters and the most effective civic action workers in Vietnam. When I hear criticism of the Vietnamese armed forces, I am reminded of that example.
As you know, we're fighting a war with no front lines, since the enemy hides among the people, in the jungles and mountains, and uses covertly border areas of neutral countries. One cannot measure progress by lines on a map. We therefore have to use other means to chart progress. Several indices clearly point to steady and encouraging success. As an example, two years ago, the Republic of Vietnam had fewer than 30 combat-ready battalions. Today, it has 154. Then there were three jet-capable runways in South Vietnam. Today, there are 14. In April 1965, there were 15 airfields that could take C-130 transport aircraft. We now have 89. Then there was one deep water port for seagoing ships. Now there are seven. In 1965, ships had to wait weeks to unload. We now turn them around in as little as one week. A year ago, there was no long-haul highway transport. Last month alone, 160,000 tons of supplies were moved over the highway. During the last year, the mileage of essential highways open for use has risen from about 52% to 80%. During 1965, the Republic of Vietnam Armed Forces and its allies killed 36,000 of the enemy at a cost of approximately 12,000 friendly killed. And 90% of these were Vietnamese. During recent months, this three-to-one ratio in favor of the Allies has risen significantly and in some weeks has been as high as 10 or 20 to 1 in our favor. In 1965, 11,000 Viet Cong defected to the side of the government. In 1966, there were 20,000. In the first three months of 1967, there have been nearly 11,000 rallies a figure that equals all of 1965 and more than half of all of 1966. <laughs> in 1964 and in the first part of 1965, the ratio of weapons captured was two to one in favor of the enemy. The ratio for 1966 in the first three months of this year is two and one half to one in favor of the Republic of Vietnam and its allies. Our president and the representatives of the people of the United States, the Congress, has seen to it that our troops in the field have been well supplied and equipped. When a field commander does not have to look over his shoulder to see whether he's being supported, he can concentrate on the battlefield with much greater assurance of success. I speak for my troops when I say we are thankful for this unprecedented material support. As I have said before, in evaluating the enemy strategy, it is evident to me that he believes our Achilles heel is our resolve. Your continued strong support is vital to the success of our mission. Our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guardmen 
in Vietnam are the finest ever fielded by our nation. In this assessment, I include Americans of all races, creeds, and colors. Your servicemen in Vietnam are intelligent, skilled, dedicated, and courageous. In these qualities, no unit, no service, no ethnic group, and no national origin can claim priority. These men understand the conflict and their complex roles as fighters and as builders. They believe in what they're doing. They are determined to provide the shield of security behind which the Republic of Vietnam can develop and prosper. <laughs> can develop and prosper for its own sake and for the future and freedom of all Southeast Asia. <laughs> Backed at home by resolve, confidence, patience, determination, and continued support, we will prevail in Vietnam over the communist aggressor. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, members of Congress, I am sure you are as proud to represent our men serving their country and the free world in Vietnam as I am to command them. General Westmoreland concludes his speech before a joint meeting of Congress salutes the senators and the representatives. A standing ovation for General William Westmoreland. He was interrupted 19 times during the address. At one point when he said that we will prevail in Vietnam over communist aggression, those in attendance in the House chamber up applauded for about a minute.